All right, we'll go ahead and start. Um, we'll probably have a few more people come in a little bit late, but that's okay. I wanna thank everyone for coming and attending our, um, this is our third Lunch and Learn with Dr. Susan Patton. She is the chair of the nursing department of the University of Arkansas. And today she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about um, the coronavirus, some specifics about it, how the nursing department at the university is helping, and a little bit more, she'll answer some questions at the end. If you all will do me a favor and keep your mics muted so we can hear Dr. Patton as well as possible. And if you have a question, if you'll look at the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, feel free to message a question in there and I will facilitate questions at the end and ask Dr. Patton so we can hear her answers. So um, without further ado, Dr. Susan Patton. Well, thank you and thank you for asking me to give this talk. I feel somewhat humbled um, in talking about a subject that I literally knew nothing about 60 days ago. And um, the research and the information coming out about coronavirus changes daily. So it's, it's been somewhat of a challenge to, to keep up with it. But I'll start out just by talking what is a coronavirus. And it's a member of a family called Corona Veridae. And there's several members of this family are circulating uh, constantly in the human population and cause mild respiratory diseases like the common cold. But a novel coronavirus is a new coronavirus that has not been previously identified. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the virus that causes coronavirus disease 2019, or commonly known as COVID-19, is not the same, obviously, as the coronaviruses that circulate among humans and cause mild illnesses like the common cold. But it's not the first novel coronavirus that we have been introduced to. You might remember um, the SARS coronavirus, and SARS stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It emerged in 2002 in the Guangdong um, province in China. And the Chinese horseshoe bat was the natural reservoir host, and the intermediate host was the civet cat and the raccoon dogs. And that particular um, disease, there were 8,000 8, cases and about 774 deaths. So the second um, novel coronavirus that was identified was the MERS, and that, that stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And that was identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. And there, um, here the intermediate host, the animal, was the dromedary camel. So 800 people were killed in the Middle East as a result of MERS. So the, the virus that we're talking about today, the COVID-19 or COVID-2, emerged in Wuhan, Hubei province. I think everybody's probably familiar with that um, just from watching the news. But this in, initial cluster of infections was linked to a uh, seafood market and potentially due to an animal contact. They haven't um, identified 100% yet what that animal was, but they believe it was an animal called a pangolin, which is a small, looks almost like a anteater. So that's how um, it got started in China. And then the next question, you know, people often ask is, well, how did it, how did it spread so fast? And I think um, to discuss that, I wanna introduce you to um, a statistic that is used by epidemiologists that's called the R naught. So um, it, if I could show it to you, it's a, it's a capital R with a small zero um, at the bottom. And it's pronounced not like naughty, so R naught. And the R naught really is the average number of people that one person with a virus infection um, will infect. So they believe that the R naught, you know, based on the data that they have for the COVID-19 is between two and two and a half. So we can compare that with some other um, common diseases that we're familiar with. For instance, um, H1N1 influenza, the R0 was 1.46 to 1.48. Um, measles has a very high R0, 12 to 18. Polio also 
high compared to the coronavirus, five to seven. So this really means the number of people that one person will infect. So maybe um, the best way to illustrate that to you is use an analogy with um, using pennies. So if I gave you a choice of um, giving you a million dollars today or one penny today that would double every day for a month, which would you choose? So I hope you choose the penny. And here's why I'll, il I'll illustrate. So in a typical month of 30 days, if I give you a penny today, 30 days from now, that penny's gonna double every day. So tomorrow it'll be two pennies, and then the next day four pennies, and the next day eight, and so forth and so on. If we get to the end of 30 days, it's going to be worth $5.3 million. And if you were particularly lucky and you chose a month that had 31 days, it would be worth $10.6 million. So if I drew that out in a graph, um, I'll try to illustrate it with my hands, the, the curve would be very flat for a long time, very flat, and then start gradually go up and then go up very rapidly. And indeed, if you look at the number of cases across the world, that's, that's what that curve looks like. So it's at what we call an exponential curve. So what, what determines the r naught? How, how is the r naught for the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 determined? Well, one, one is the contact rate, how many people an infected person is in contact with. So obviously that's gonna depend on where you are. So if you're in a, if New York City, for instance, and you're riding on a very busy subway, you're gonna be in contact with many more people and have an opportunity to infect many more people if you have um, COVID-19. If you're in a fairly rural state like Arkansas, and you're not in contact with a lot of people, then that's going to um, decrease the R naught. So when we say it's two to two and a half, we're looking at average ac across everywhere. But as we know, it's not the it's not the same in every location. So the second thing that determines the R naught is the infectious period. How long is a person going to be shedding virus? And this is not fully known about. COVID-19, but based on existing literature that we have about the other coronaviruses and what we've seen so far, we believe that the incubation period, and that's the time of exposure uh, to the time of development of illness, ranges anywhere from two to 14 days. So that means if you have um, uh, developed corona or you ha have the virus, then you, if for 14 days, you could be shedding the virus. And then we look at mode of transmission. How is this virus transmitted? And that, that's very important because, um, uh, well, corona is transmitted by droplets. And these are relatively large droplets. So when you sneeze, um, cough, talk, or sing, um, and you're going to um, transmit these droplets about three to five feet. So they are large, relatively large, uh, wet and heavy. So they're not going to travel very far, three to five feet. So that's the source of where we get the six foot rule. We try to stay six feet away from each other um, in case we are shedding virus. Um, also, um, it's different from TB or measles, which have a much higher r naught, and that's because the droplets are much smaller, so they can travel further in the air. So keep in mind about the droplets, because I'll come back to that in a minute. But we also know that when these droplets are aerosolized, that they travel much further. So what causes them to be aerosolized? Well, it's procedures like intubation. So intubating a patient to put them on the ventilator causes these droplets to travel all over the place. And that is one reason why you see that healthcare workers are con contacting the virus at a much higher rate than the general population. So uh, other um, types of procedures that cause aerosolization include extubation or taking, taking the tube out, the endotracheal tube um, that connects the patient to the ventilator collecting sputum, um, performing CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, also will aerosolize the droplets. 
uh, procedures like bronchoscopy or autopsy. So that's why um, these um, healthcare workers that are potentially being exposed through aerosolization are, are needing to wear very um, um, heavy duty, what I call heavy duty um, protective equipment to keep them from being exposed to, to viruses. So what about surfaces or, or objects? Well, the virus, if it, if it is um, transported through the air, it's gonna land somewhere. So if, if it lands on a surface, um, it can stay there for hours and some um, studies have shown even, even days. So that's why it's very important to wash your hands um, because we're constantly touching objects all, all day long. So we wash your hands and then don't touch your face in case you have touched something and contacted the virus. You don't, don't wanna touch your face because that's where it could enter through your mouth or your eyes or nose. And then we wanna routinely clean um, frequently touch surfaces. So things like doorknobs, um, light switches, um, places where you're preparing food that you're constantly touching. It's a good idea to just clean them on a daily basis and use a good um, uh, cleansing um, solution. Um, the CDC on their website has a list of um, cleaning solutions that have been uh, shown to um, eliminate the COVID uh, virus. And one of the most interesting ones is a common thing that we all use called Windex. So um, if you want to clean your doorknobs and uh, light switches and um, cabinets in your kitchen, that would be a good choice. Also, you can use bleach that's been diluted. I like a one to 10 solution of bleach and um, that, that will kill all of the virus. Okay, so if you do contact the virus, what are some symptoms that you should look for? And I think probably everybody's pretty familiar with this, but fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And one of the reasons that um, this virus causes respiratory symptom, sim symptoms is that for this infection to occur, for us to get an infection after we've encountered the virus, the virus's spike protein must engage with the receptor on the cell surface. So you've all seen pictures of the coronavirus. It's very beautiful and you see these um, spikes, um, proteins that are kind of appendages coming off of it. Well, they have to find a receptor inside the body to attach to in order for infection to occur. In addition, um, it, the virus needs a, a one or more cofactors. Otherwise, it's not gonna be able to penetrate our cells. So scientists, um, after they've conducted some single cell sequencing, have discovered that there's certain progenitor cells in the bronchi, which are mainly responsible for producing these coronavirus um, receptors. So that's, that's why we see the symptoms of coughing and shortness of breath, and in some patients, acute respiratory symptoms. So they also know that this receptor density increases with age and is generally higher in men than it is in women. So um, we've heard a lot about, you know, how we, we know that social distancing has worked and it has worked because it's reduced the number of people that we're in contact with. So that's helped to reduce the R naught. And there's a lot of talk about, well, when can we go back to having less social distancing and have somewhat of business as usual, maybe open up some businesses. And uh, uh, this is because of the um, economic burden that this um, illness has, has uh, created, not just in the United States, but everywhere. So in thinking about how we could maybe um, open up a little bit more, uh, we hear a lot about testing. So what, what, what does this testing entail? So the testing that's being done right now is, is called PCR testing, and that stands for polymerase uh, chain reaction. It's a method used by making a large number of copies of the DNA of the virus um, from, a, from a sample, and then this really amplifies the DNA and enables the genes of interest to be detected or measured. So there's a protein on the RNA of the coronavirus 
that causes the infection. And that, that's what the scientists are looking for. So in this testing method, they swab, they get a swab from the nasal cavity pretty far back and send it to a lab. And so most of these labs are running this, these tests on big machines and they can run thousands at a time. And the other way of testing is an individual test that does one at a time. But right now, this is how most of the testing is being done um, here in the United States. The next wave of testing is called serology, and that is going to be used to detect immunity. And it will use a method that, that's been used for many years called ELISA. So right now, the local and state health departments and some public health laboratories are doing most of the testing, and the FDA has issued some emergency youth authorization authorization through clinical laboratories to allow them to do testing as well. So we've all heard a lot of stories about, you know, why can't we do more testing? What, what is holding this up? And there's um, a series of answers to that from lack of swabs to lack of reagents to trouble running the machines. And, you know, what, why can't we use rapid testing? Well, from an epidemiological standpoint, you have to look at a test in, in its specificity and its sensitivity. You want a test to be sensitive enough to pick up all the positive cases. But if it's too sensitive, then it's going to pick up what we call false positive. It's going to create false positive tests if it's not specific enough. So it's almost like a, a balancing between specific and sensitive. So if it's, if it's too um, specific, then you're going to get false negatives. And if it's too sensitive, then you're going to get false positives. So that, that's why they want to be careful about the test and make sure that uh, the tests are accurate. So another question that um, people ask a lot is, will warm weather stop the outbreak? And my answer to that is no, uh, not necessarily. Uh, we don't really know. And um, it doesn't really change the virus. It might change how the virus is transmitted. So remember I talked about uh, that these are very large droplets and they're heavy and they fall. And they, they are going to fall quicker when the air is less humid. So when the air becomes um, more humid in the summer and, and it's hot, then the viruses um, are not gonna stay in the air as long. So maybe I said that backwards. When they're going to um, fall a lot quicker when the air is less humid. So like um, in the winter time when we're all inside and we have our heaters going, the air is very dry. But in the summer, um, when the humidity goes up, um, then the um, virus is gonna spread a, a lot less. So that's one thing we're looking at, but so far we don't have enough information yet to even know if that, that's the case. Um, some other viruses, like the ones that cause the flu and the common cold, do spread more in the cold weather months, uh, but that not, doesn't mean that it's impossible to become sick with the flu or the cold during other months, and we all know that from past experience. So generally coronaviruses are gonna survive for shorter periods at higher temperatures and higher humidity. Uh, people ask, you know, well, if I freeze them, will that kill it? And the answer there is definitely no. In fact, that's how we test. When we do testing and we do experiments on viruses, we freeze them because when they thaw out, they come back to their uh, original state. So freezing them do does not work. So there's actually, you know, a lot more that we need to learn about the transmissibility, the severity, and other features associated with this virus and the investigations are ongoing. And in fact, I, I read something this morning talking about 60 articles a day and researchers all over the world are, are racing to come up with answers to how the virus is transmitted, uh, how it, to best test for it, um, how to treat it. And of course, a vaccine. So we've all heard you know, that there's going to be a vaccine developed and that this may take a year to 18 months. And um, the question often asked is why so long? And really the, the right question is, is why so short? Because usually it takes five to eight years to, to make a vaccine. So what's going on with um, 
uh, the COVID-19 is we have several companies that have, have already uh, produced a vaccine and are shipping them out for, for testing. Um, Moderna Therapeutics has shipped the first batch of vaccine to the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, and we'll begin to test that on patients in April. So probably what has speeded along the development of this vac vaccine for this disease is that early on, even probably mid-January, scientists were um, dissecting the genetic code of the S protein and found out which protein actually is responsible for causing the virus. So they, they can attach that to nanoparticles and inject it into the body and it will cause an immune reaction. So we have, like I said, some already testing some of that and we'll be testing it to a large extent in, in April. So there's a couple of stages in testing a vaccine. The first is safety. And so ho hopefully we'll, we'll see whether this, these new vaccines are safe pretty quickly. And then the next phase is to test it for efficacy. Does it really um, cause immunity to occur? So we have um, Sanofi, um, their plan is to mix the coronavirus DNA with genetic material from a harmless virus. Um, Johnson & Johnson is attempting to deactivate the um, SARS-CoV-2, um, essentially switching off the ability to cause illness while ensuring that it still stimulates the immune system. So there's several companies that, that have things that they're, they're working on. And it will be great if we can get a vaccine in a year to 18 months. And then another subject that people are interested in is, is treatment. And there's a lot of research going on about treatment as, as well. So NIH scientists um, have begun testing an antiviral drug. It's called rem remdesivir. Um, and this, this drug was actually developed um, for treating Ebola. So they've tested it in some patients and it, it seems to be working. So that, that is great news. Um, it's, this trial um, is being led by um, scientists at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And actually the first patient to volunteer to try it was um, a person who brought back to the United States uh, positive. Um, he caught it abo aboard the Diamond Princess. So he was the first one to actually volunteer to test this new drug. And it, it has showed encouraging results among animals that were affected with coronavirus. And um, another um, for the SARS and also for the MERS. So, in looking at drugs that can um, treat this virus, one of the things that um, uh, is, is very interesting to me is that there's a, uh, a thing called Reframe, and that is a group of scientists that are looking at drugs that already exist and seeing if they can be repurposed to treat this illness. And what's interesting about that is that these drugs have already been through the trials that show that they're safe and we know what the side effects are. So they can be um, brought to market or used to treat um, new diseases pretty quickly. So um, we've also heard a lot about um, the drug chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, chloroquine works from blocking viruses from binding to human cells and getting inside them to replicate. And it also may stimulate the immune system. And um, it's been widely used to treat diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. And we've also heard some trials um, combining it with uh, azithromycin, uh, commonly known as ZPAC. Um, hydroxychloroquine is a, another drug that is kind of a deactivated form of chloroquine, so it has fewer side effects and it, um, the toxicity of it is reduced. So there's been some trials using those drugs, and I think we've heard uh, President Trump talk about that a lot. Um, some of the early trials now are beginning to show that they're not really that effective as we had hoped. But again, we're early in the research process here, so it's very difficult to come up with a conclu conclusion. Another treatment that's being tried is called convalescent plasma therapy, where um, the plasma from patients, pa patients who have had COVID and recovered, donate their plasma, and that's given to patients who are very ill, and it helps to boost their immune system. So all, all of these things are being tried, and we 
like I said, we're seeing a lot of articles being published daily. Um, it's almost hard to keep up with, with the latest. So um, one thing I wanted to share with you before ending um, that has been really interesting to me, I read an article yesterday um, that was in the Journal of American Medical Association, and they talk about the experience in Iceland. And we've heard a lot about the experience in Korea and the experience in um, other, other countries that seem to have had a, a little, maybe a little bit better response. And Iceland, what was interesting in what they did, um, they actually targeted testing to people who had symptoms, um, which is how we're doing it in the United States as well. But they, um, so people who had symptoms or people who had traveled to high-risk countries were tested. But they also randomly tested uh, from the population over 2,000 people and then had an open invitation that anyone who wanted testing could come and get tested. And they tested about 11,000 people there. So in this um, uh, testing that they did, they found that children under 10 years of age and females have a lower incidence of infection than adolescents or adults and males. And they found that the, um, they screened them early in March and then again in April, and it, it, this didn't change a whole lot. Um, so, you know, by, by doing this kind of testing, I think they're able to have better data. Um, and for instance, they're gonna open up the elementary schools um, with the knowledge that this doesn't spread so much in children um, as it does in adults. And that, that um, may be a, you know, a better way to think about opening it up if you have uh, really good and interesting data, um, or interesting wasn't the right word, but data that you can rely on um, that tells you what you need to know. So hopefully we will get to the point in the United States where we can do that kind of testing. Right now, as you, you can look at um, CDC's website. They will tell you how what the priorities for testing are. Priority one is for people who are in the hospital or healthcare workers who have symptoms. Then priority two is patients in long-term care facilities, 65 of age and older who have symptoms, underlying conditions with symptoms, uh, first responders with symptoms. And then we get to priority three, and that's critical infrastructure workers with symptoms, um, healthcare facility workers and first responders, and individuals with mild symptoms. So in some places we're at priority three in testing, in some places we don't have enough testing yet to, to get there. So um, I, hopefully, you know, with the plan of increasing testing, we can get there. Now, as for um, what we're doing here at the Eleanor Mann School of Nursing, I first should preface this by telling you that we have multiple programs. So our largest program is a face-to-face -face program, and we have about 500 students enrolled in that. And th those students were sent, uh, well, we went to online only on March the 12th. And then most of them w went home <clears throat> during spring break. So we're still teaching those students, and we're doing that all online. Then we have an online nurse practitioner program with about 80 students. And those students are, are nurses. They're um, getting their nurse practitioner degree. Um, they're all over the country and in some other countries as well. And they were continuing to teach them online just like we always did, but they're continuing to do their clinical rotations as long as the facility will allow them to. And a lot of facilities have, have shut down most of their routine surgeries and, and not critical services. So some of them are able to um, complete their clinicals and some will have to wait. Uh, we do have a number of students that are working in critical care and um, I can share with you some of their experiences that they're having. Um, and I, I have one student in my class who lives in Korea. So early in January, um, she was reporting to us what was going on in Korea and they did extensive testing. She, her husband's in the military and um, there was a, a lady on the military base who developed symptoms. Well, they were able to, they have a lot of CTV or televisions outside to track people. They were able, through the use of CTV, tracking her cell phone and her credit card use to know everywhere she'd been and who she'd contacted. And so they were able to isolate all those people and they did that all across the country. So 
with the use of technology and uh, cell phone and credit card tr tracing. So that's our DMP program. Then we have um, students who are online who are, have associate degrees in nursing, are LPNs, and are working towards their bachelor's degree. So they are also all over the country and they're able to complete their clinical if the facility will let them. So we see really a, a mix there uh, of what facilities will and will not allow at this point. So our students are, are not in clinical, um, and this is because um, three things. Really, we wanted to make sure that we kept them safe and didn't expose them to the virus um, unintentionally. Um, second, um, the nurses are really busy in the hospital and, and don't have time to teach students. And third um, reason is that the hospitals were um, anticipating a shortage of PPE or personal uh, protection equipment and didn't have enough to share with students. So we are teaching all of our face-to-face um, -face students online at the moment. Um, our, our faculty did an amazing job of switching from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching almost overnight. Um, I think our department's a lot luckier than some departments. Um, uh, probably lucky is not the right word, but fortunate in that, you know, we, we teach online, so half of our students are already online, so almost all of our faculty was used to teaching online, and so that we made that transition pretty easily. Now, some of our students work in hospitals and um, nursing homes as um, uh, certified nurse assistants or techs or nurse interns, and many of them have continued to work. And um, although they haven't really, especially in Northwest Arkansas, been taking care of patients with COVID-19, some of our students in, in Little Rock have and are working, especially in the intensive care unit and sharing those experiences. Um, another, another, some other ways that the nursing school has been involved. Um, we, of course, have a lot of um, laboratories here and a lot of simulation labs where our students learn how to do different um, procedures. So we had a lot of personal protective equipment that we're not going to use this year because we have no students. So we we were able to donate those to the hospitals. And we have been also collaborating with the engineering department, and the engineering department has um, come into our simulation lab and used some of our equipment to make a prototype for a ventilator, and also made an acrylic box that you could actually put over a patient's head when you're doing a procedure like intubation to keep um, the provider from being just totally sprayed with COVID-19 droplets. So those are some of the ways that we're participating right now. And um, I hope that you know, we'll be able to uh, get our students back in clinical soon. Um, and that, that may look very different than the way we're doing it at the moment. But um, we think that with these virtual simulations, we can teach them critical thinking. We can teach them interpersonal skills. And our students are really smart. So I, I have faith that they'll be able to catch up with their psychomotor skills very quickly once they're allowed back into the clinical sites. So uh, that's all that I had prepared to say, so I think it's time to open it up for questions. All right, Dr. Patton. Um, one question we have from Katie Harrison is, is it currently safe to donate blood? Um, yes, it is safe and it's actually encouraged because blood is very needed. Because, you know, as we're all sheltering in place, um, people continue to have normal life things happen to them where they need blood. And so, um, yes, and of course the blood bank is practicing social distancing. They are being very careful and using gloves and masks and all types of personal protective equipment, but you should call your blood bank if you're um, inclined to donate blood, and now is really a time of great need. Perfect, thank you. And if anyone else has a question, if you will open the chat box and type in your question, I will facilitate those questions and ask them to Dr. Patton. 
And so maybe I should spend a few minutes talking about masks because that's something that came up a couple of weeks ago about the importance of masks. So I have two different ones here. One was made by my neighbor and then one that um, you can make with just a bandana very easily by folding it and putting a couple of rubber bands and then attaching the ends together and just putting, so very easy. You don't even need a sewing machine for that one. Um, so why are we wearing masks? Well, the idea behind the mask is if you did have COVID-19 and you didn't know it, you were asymptomatic, um, you could transmit it to other people by talking or coughing or singing, um, sneezing. And so the, the mask is really to protect other people. Um, it's not going to really provide you a great deal of protection if you're exposed because it's not designed to um, really screen out um, all the particles, but it will protect people. And so it's encouraged that if you're going into the grocery store or um, anywhere where you're going to be ex you know, near other people that you do wear the mask. And I think, uh, you know, from what I'm reading, we're all going to be encouraged to wear masks, um, maybe for a long period of time. And so um, it's, it's a good idea. Um, to me, in thinking about patients and patient care, um, it really people who are sick should wear them. And there's no doubt about that. But there's a stigma attached to being sick and to, to having um, may, maybe having any kind of respiratory illness right now. So if we're all wearing a mask, then we all look alike and it takes away that, that stigma, which I, I, I think is an important consideration. Okay, so here's a couple of uh, questions. Do you think the current efforts in plasma from recovered patients for boosting the immunity system will work? Well, um, there, are, there is some evidence that it is working. Uh, again, the clinical trials are pretty early, but from what we've seen, this is actually working to help some some of the patients that are in the intensive care unit and helping to boost their immunity. So yes, I, I do think it's going to help and, and work with some patients. Then how safe should we feel on the bike trails? Uh, what about riding behind someone else on the trail? Could we catch the disease that way? Um, well, here's where the six foot rule comes into place because remember these are pretty big droplets and they're not gonna really travel beyond six feet. So if you stay six feet behind the person, then I think you're, you're pretty safe. Um, I, I don't know, you know if, how, how easy it is to wear a mask when riding a bike, but that's probably not a bad idea as well. Um, and again, it, it can land on a surface. So if you're getting on a bike, um, you might want to clean it first with soap and water, or um, um, if you can get it, a, a san san sanitized wipe, like a Clorox wipe, or um, Windex, so it is very helpful. Okay, if your hospital has ample PPE and respirators, is it safe for us nurses to be around family? Well, again, I, I think that um, depends on what you're doing. And we see um, some of our nurses who are working in intensive care are exposed to high, high doses of a virus. So it, it's what we call dose dependent. So you t if people who are really sick are, are gonna have higher doses of virus and they're going to be um, disseminating higher doses of virus. So if you're working in the intensive care and you're taking care of four or five patients with COVID, um, your protective equipment is gonna help you somewhat, but just to be really safe, you probably don't wanna go home to your family um, every night and come back the next day and do it again. So um, I told you we had some students that are working out in the field. I have one student who is an intensive care nurse in New Orleans and she signed up for 12 shifts. So her mother came and got her children and took them to her house for three weeks. Uh, so, you know, to limit the exposure to her children. Um, and we see in places like New York, some of the hotels have set up places for doctors and nurses to stay so they don't have to go home to their family. So obviously taking care of patients that are this sick is as stressful enough as it is. 
and uh, just the thought that you might expose your family to the virus adds another whole layer of, of stress. Now, if you're um, working in the hospital and you're not really um, exposed to patients who knowingly have COVID-19 or, or are sick with it, um, I think using your protective equipment properly is probably going to provide you enough protection. Now, that being said, we know that most of healthcare workers um, get infected, you know, one, because of the viral load, two, it's in taking off their protective equipment. So they have to put the protective equipment on, we call that donning, and taking it off, doffing in a, in a very um, systematic way. So a lot of intensive care units now have uh, what we call spotters. These are nurses that do nothing else but watch people take off their protective equipment to make sure that they're following the protocol. And this is a, a strategy or a technique that um, healthcare learned from the aviation industry of having a checklist. So we want to follow that checklist very carefully when doffing our protective equipment. So uh, again, um, you know, just hearing experiences from some, some of our students, um, she talks about being in the intensive care unit and having to go to the bathroom. So when they go to the bathroom, they have to doff all their equipment, walk down a long hall, um, again, to provide some degree of protection, um, go to the bathroom, come back, and then don the whole thing on over again. That process of going to the bathroom takes an hour. So um, you, you know, have a lot of empathy, really, for the people that are doing this. Um, this week, um, I put on all the protective equipment to just experiment with the box that you can put your hands through. And I probably had it on for 30 minutes and I was sweating, um, just totally sweating. So um, I, again, just, I have a ton of empathy for people that are doing that. Okay, so what is your take on Arkansas's lower hospitalization rate compared to bordering states? Are we doing something different? Well, um, first of all, Arkansas is a, a, a pretty rural state. So going back to that R naught, you know, we have probably an, a lower R naught due to the fact that we're just not exposing, um, there's less opportunity for exposure, I guess, to say, because we're not crowded like we are in New York. If you've ever ridden in the subway of New York where you, you have to stand up, people are packed in there like sardines, you can see you know, the, the difference. So I think that's one reason. Um, also, we probably had a lot less people traveling to high-risk areas. So high-risk areas, you know, in this Iceland study really showed, um, besides China, the ski resorts in Austria and Italy. And so a lot of patients um, in, or people that were symptomatic in Iceland, that's where they got it. And then they saw also that they, uh, and it's very interesting that they can actually tell by the DNA where, where it came from. A lot uh, came from um, London or England. So even before they realized they had an issue, um, they were um, very contagious and transmitting illness. So um, I think that's one thing about Arkansas that has protected us from really overwhelming the healthcare system. Uh, if we look at Louisiana, um, Louisiana is a hot spot, and that's because they had Mardi Gras, and people came from all over the state and other places, and they get really close together at Mardi Gras, and um, they transmitted uh, COVID-19 and then took it back to their communities. Also, um, when COVID-19 gets into places like nursing homes or prisons where people are close together um, and there's a lot of visitors, um, then um, you, you see transmission pretty high. So I, I think Arkansas has got a handle on that situation pretty early. Um, one thing I try to do every day at 1.30 is listen, listen to Governor Hutchinson's um, conference on COVID-19. Um, it, to me, it's one of the best sources of information. Um, it, it's, he, he does a really good job of keeping it non-political. Um, Nate Smith, the chief um, medical officer uh, presents its statistics. Um, they tell us you know, what we need to do to really help with this situation. Um, and what we're doing is working, the social distancing and people staying home and staying six feet away from each other is, is obviously 
helped to reduce that R naught and flatten the curve. And so we look, we look at that curve and remember I told you it was exponential, it, it's more flat. Now when you flatten the curve, you actually extend it a little bit. So if we first heard that Arkansas was gonna peak at, on April the 24th, I think they've now extended it to April the 27th. But we, we have seen that we're not overtaxing our healthcare system. Uh, we've actually been able to send some vent ventilators to Louisiana um, to help them. And so hopefully it, it will stay that way. Dr. Patton, I had someone text me a question. Okay. It says, with current testing in Fayetteville, are the tests for COVID-19 being shipped off to another state to check for results? And what is the current time frame to find out a result after one has been tested? Well, here, here's what I know. Um, they are being sent to the Arkansas Department of Health lab. And again, uh, it's being prioritized because we don't have wide um, availability of tests. And it takes uh, anywhere from three to five days to get a result. So that's what I know. Now that could have changed in, since the last time I looked at it, but that, that is what I have heard. Okay. Are there any more questions? If you have one, please put it in the chat for Dr. Patton. If, if someone's typing. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, um, I appreciate the audience and bearing with me and just a disclaimer again that you know, uh, 30 days ago, I knew very little about COVID-19. Um, 60 days, it, it was something of interest, but not something I would have to get so familiar with. So I'm learning um, and um, it is a very dynamic process. Something new is happening probably as we speak. So, uh, what food should I eat to boost my immune system? Well, I think um, um, we all know what good um, eating is, is like. Be, sh be sure to get your five fruits and vegetables every day, even though it, it may be a little bit more difficult to get the fresh fruits and vegetables with um, our current uh, stay at home um, policies. But I, I've heard that grocery stores are good about delivering. Um, we now have um, the farmer's market open here in Febble and you can put an order in early and they will, give you a time frame when you can come pick it up. Um, uh, people need plenty of protein. Vitamin D is important. Um, so be sure um, if you don't get enough vitamin D in your, in your diet to take a supplement. And um, that, that would be my dietary recommendation. Well, all right. Uh, Dr. Patton, we appreciate you coming on and speaking with us today so much. And like I had told um, Dr. Patton earlier, we have been recording this session and we will be posting it to our Arkansas Alumni Association YouTube channel. So if you know anyone that wasn't able to make it today or um, wasn't able to tune in live, please feel free to share that link with them as soon as we get it up so that they can learn all of the information that Dr. Patton has presented to us too. But, we truly appreciate it, Dr. Patton. Thank you for all you and the nursing students are doing and keeping us informed. Um, I know it's great to have um, good solid information when you have a lot of fear and um, false information coming from other sources. So it's great to get some facts from someone who knows them. Thank you, thank you. And um, thank you all for coming and we will see you next time.